Hey guys, how are you doing? This is Zeph from Z Outdoors and I hope you're having an awesome day. So today I've come down to see full-time craftsman and maker, Oliver Klotzek. Oliver, how are you doing? Very good, sir, thank you. Right, if you're not familiar with Oliver, Oliver is one half of the duo called Wild Crafted Workshop. Oliver Klotzek is originally from Germany and he's partnered up with his wife, also a full-time maker, Raleigh Klotzek, who's from the US. Now this video is part two of a two-part series because what Oliver's speciality is, amongst many things, is turning bowls and certain other receptacles on a foot-powered pole lathe. Now in part one, what we documented was Raleigh Klotzek covered her entire process for turning a wooden bowl on a foot powered pole lathe. So this part two, what we're going to be looking at is Oliver's process for actually forging a hook tool that's very specific for turning bowls on a foot powered pole lathe. And we're going to be looking at the entire process from literally the raw metal all the way to a finished product. So in a moment, what we're gonna do, we're gonna have a look at the actual overview of the hook tool itself, and then we're gonna begin the rest of the process in this entire video, as well as talk to Oliver a little bit about his background and what it is that he does, and what brings him to this video that we're going to be documenting today. So a couple of things I will mention before we get cracking on with the meats and bones of this video. Number one, this entire video is timestamped in, uh, into all the different sections. So if you look on the timestamp below this video, you can scroll through it, you can see all the different sections marked out. Also, if you look in the description just below this video, you will see all the different chapters mapped out. On the left-hand side, you will see all the times. YouTube has a very cool feature where you click on that time and it will jump straight to that particular section. Because this video is designed as an actual reference, a tutorial that you can refer to as you move forward. What I'm also going to do is put a link below to the part one of this two-part series where Oliver's wife, Riley Klotzek, demonstrates the entire process for actually turning a wooden bowl on a pole lathe. And so, I highly recommend you go check that out if you're not familiar with the process or you want a reminder of how the process works. And finally, without you know, uh, a mention, is what I'm gonna do is put a link below to Wild Crafting Workshop website and also their Instagram, where you can find out a lot more information about everything that we're going to be talking about in this video and that we also covered in the previous video. So Oliver, with your kind permission, shall we begin? Yes, of course, let's crack on. So I hope you enjoyed the rest of this video. So Oliver, before we begin the actual tutorial, I wanted to take a moment out and talk a little bit about yourself, about your background, where you're from, etc. Because obviously for those that are not familiar with you, it will give them a better understanding of you as a maker. Mm -hmm. So where is it you're from and what's your journey into full-time crafting? Well, I'm from Eastern Germany, around Dresden, about like an hour from Dresden, the area. I grew up there and like spent like all my life there really until I was uh, about 20. Um, I, did a, I did a training uh, to be a nurse, so I was a nurse uh, for like about 15-ish years. And um, yeah, I lived in a little house and um, my journey really started with chopping firewood basically and I um, once like, I came, um, I got the idea of like I wanted to fell a tree with an axe, so just to make firewood. So and on those on this journey of like uh, finding this axe, um, I found a book from Mike Abbott, uh, his first book about green woodwork, and yeah, I got this book because it was totally fascinating me and. Uh, yeah, so my journey began and like I um, reached out or like looked around Germany where are there green wo woodworkers anywhere and like I found one back at the time um, where I, I went to take a class and learn how to turn bolts and the next step for me was uh, because I knew by the time that a lot uh, is going on about green woodwork in the UK so I came to the UK um, to the Botches Bowl in 2018 and yeah then like this was a huge push in my life to like enter this community and uh, learn more about not just turning bowls but like carving spoons like all all sorts of things and yeah in the end of course like making your own tools to yeah 
as, yeah, as the next step for um, well, as the next step for the uh, for the process of making uh, your own like wooden items and stuff. Because you and your wife have obviously been travelling around full time in the van. We're actually looking at behind you. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, that's it. So. You're obviously making full time. So at the yeah. moment, you are both settled in Sweden. Is that correct? That's correct, right? Yeah. Um, so obviously, you're here in the UK. Obviously, we were both at the Bodgers Ball the weekend prior to us filming just now. Yes. Um, and obviously, I feel very honoured as well. You have taken the time for me to yeah. document your process. <laughs> you know, I've, I know you've come on your own journey, yeah. and you're also a very established turner. You were teaching the turning classes at the Bodgers Ball, and I spoke to some of the students who were really, really excited. Uh, to learn from you. So in this video now, I really look forward to kind of seeing your process for the hook tools. So starting now with the actual process itself mm -hmm. for forging a hook tool, um, obviously here on the table, you've got the different stages kind of laid out. So as a general kind of overview, could you kind of talk us through in terms of the process we're going to be looking at in this video? Yes, so uh, you basically start with a, uh, a bar of steel. So that particular steel is um, a spring steel, EN47. So basically that's the steel like coil springs are made out of, like for, uh, for cars. You could, don't have to um, get like new steel necessarily, you can basically um, go to a, a, a junkyard or dump and like when you find like car springs um, you can uh, of course they are bent and like um, in a spiral, in a spiral. <laughs> um, you can straighten them and use that steel as well that's uh, completely fine because one thing yeah. I think it's important to touch on actually as we talk through this process is obviously you teach and make full-time um, yes. But when it comes to, for example, specifically the tools, you also teach and run classes back in Sweden, but also around Europe and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, so people will come and learn from you how to make the tools. But would I be right in saying that you also sell you know, the tools yourself, both from the raw metal all the way to a finished tool on your website? Is that correct? That's correct, right. So every, every stage you can see here, like you can basically order from us. If you just want to start from the beginning or like have a kind of a blank that is already sharpened, all the, of course, the finished product itself is available on our website. Excellent. So you started off from the raw metal itself. Um, so would you like to talk a little bit about the, the length of it, the diameter, etc., cetera, um, just so people have a rough idea of what they're going to be looking at? Yeah, so um, the length I chose is uh, about like 30 centimeters. Uh, you can do it shorter or, or longer, like really what you prefer. Um, the reason I chose like 30 centimeters is simply because when I get stock for myself, I get a meter length and like I get three tools out of it. So it's about 30 to 33 centimeters. That's really the main reason. And uh, thickness also, um, varies a bit so if you like a more chunkier tool that you can hold better on the lathe some people prefer that um, of course the less material the cheaper it is to buy uh, and you have less forging to do for the uh, for the cutting edge actually so there are pros and cons to using the wider or thinner steel basically exactly yeah so in terms of the overview of the process, so we're starting off with the raw steel, um, and are these all the different stages then that we're going to be working through? Exactly, yeah. So before we begin then with the actual forging um, itself, mm -hmm. so at the moment, the one thing I do need to mention is we are currently using the workshop uh, belonging to uh, full-time toolmaker Oscar Rush, who has very kindly let us use his kind of space here. So he's got a lot of the equipment that we're going to be using. But I think it's important to state that, um, obviously this is not your normal workspace. Yeah. Uh, so obviously you're, you are also getting familiarized yeah. uh, uh, with the kind of setup, the equipment, etc. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of the first step in the process, uh, where would you like to begin, Oliver? Uh, we begin, of course, with like heating the steel on, on one end. And then we like forge like a point 
on the end um, uh, that goes into the wood, obviously, so that uh, will stuck, be stuck in the handle. And it doesn't have to be necessarily that pointy. It is kind of enough if you take uh, the cornerstone a little bit just to move it easier into the handle once you drill the hole in the wooden handle. But I like to um, do them a little bit more pointy. That's like also how I teach to make them, um, just to get familiar with the process, because that's then uh, in the next step you do this exact same thing on the other side of the tool. So yeah, that's how you start to basically make a diamond shape or a, like a square in the end of the tool. So Oliver, to begin the process, you're going to be turning on the forge, um, and so you're going to be doing the initial shape that will go into the handle, is that correct? Exactly. Yeah. Excellent stuff. So yeah, uh, the floor is all yours. I think you, we spoke just a moment off camera, you wanted to talk a little bit about the, where you learnt it from yourself and, and, and etc. Um, so would you want to talk about that now, maybe? Yeah, sure. So like, first thing to say is, that I'm not a blacksmith, like, and not an educated blacksmith. Yeah, my interest in, in forging came through green woodwork. So, because it's, it's mentioned that you, when you turn your own bolts, it's good to make your own tools as well. Like, and when you want to make different shapes or whatever, then just to learn that. So, that sparked my interest and so I went on a um, class with Matty Whittaker about five years ago and then again about two years ago and since then I did, just did stop making the tools so and of course like reached out to other experienced blacksmiths such as like Sharif Adams or um, Owen Thomas, Oscar Rush as well and a bunch of other people too. So basically, you're not an actual blacksmith, but you've learned to do blacksmithing out of necessity. Exactly. To yeah. make your own tools. Exactly, and to save money. Yes. <laughs> and stuff. So in terms of beginning the process, uh, what are you going to do? Turn on the forge and then begin the actual uh, 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 forging itself, yes? Exactly. So we use a gas forge. Uh, of course, you can do this with a coal forge as well. Um, it's been mentioned that a very simple version is of a forge uh, because you just need to heat up the metal basically. So you can basically also use a, a barbecue uh, and barbecue coal. It's not the most comfortable way, but it will heat up the metal. So if you have the barbecue uh, coal and maybe a, um, a, hair, a hair dryer and like connect it to a pipe or something, something that's blowing and like heats it up a little faster. That can work. I actually never done that, but people mentioned that and people said it can work. So, but a, a gas forge is much more comfortable also to me. I have a gas forge myself, not a big fancy one like this, but uh, yeah, it's actually not much you need. So the setup is quite uh, small that you need to actually start forging. Um, but that makes it very comfortable. Uh, it's also not so. Uh, it's easier to use once you set it, once you set a temperature or the gas flow, then you don't necessarily overheat the metal. So it's yeah, really comfortable to use. Excellent stuff. So I'll let you begin, Oliver. All right. So then turn that on. Might be a little bit loud. stage um, what are you looking to do is are you looking to get it to a certain temperature or well you know, with the gas forge you can uh, yeah regulate the, the, the flow and of course the the more uh, gas 
you feed into the forge, the more like the hotter it gets. So it takes a little bit for the, the whole thing to warm up and then like your metal, um, yeah, you want to just heat the, basically the tip of the metal, like the first like five to 10 centimeters, and that will be enough. So, and it's like glowing, glowing like a, a light orange, then it will be perfect. The harder it gets, the easier it will be to move the metal, but you gotta be careful because you don't want it too hot, because when it's too hot, then it's burning the carbon into the, uh, in the steel, and when you burn that away, it will not be able to hold the cutting edge very well. So you need to sharpen it a lot, so you don't want that. Okay, so the first step will be that we uh, create a square, kind of diamond shape, in the end of the tool. And the way to do that is, like we bring because it will be like this. We bring the um, the tool or like the, the the steel on the anvil, and we lift it a little bit up, and then we hit it with the hammer also in an angle, and that will create. Uh, so you're basically cutting off the end piece or like pushing it down. And then what we do is we just do like 90 degree or quarter turns and uh, switch back and forth. So that's the only only sides we have to do. We don't have to flip it 100 de uh, 180 degrees or all the way around because like we um, because obviously like when you hit it with the hammer here, it will become flat on the top but also on the bottom because we have a um, the anvil the anvil as basically the second hammer when you want to take it, put it like that. Yeah, the same on this side. Okay. So that needs a little bit more, that's not quite there. So it can be a little lighter. So we pop that back in. So what I'm doing, I'm always checking a bit, put it back in, then I'm just thinking what I, what, I, what I have to do, because you don't want to lose the heat, really. You, you, you kind of want to move quick. So I pull it out, check it. When I see it's the right temperature, put it back in, think about my next step, and then get it out and keep going. So I angle the steel a little bit up to lift, lift my arm up, and then put it on the back of the anvil and start hitting. See, it's getting cold quite fast. So, uh, because the anvil is cold, the hammer is cold, and it's cooling down quite cold, uh, quite fast, uh, because the steel is not as thick. Um, so, but you see the shape I'm creating here with just hitting the corner. And the reason why I put it like on the back of the anvil is just because the hammer is angled. If I would do the same thing here on the middle of the anvil, then I would just hit hit the um, the anvil with the corner of the of the of the hammer. So that's why I'm trying to push it here and just try to hit the steel versus the anvil. So yeah, and just give that another round. So I've noticed you put two in there. Was that for a particular reason? Uh, one for the filming reason, of course, because uh, when one is not going well, then we just take the material of the other one. But I also... Um, I often uh, make more tools at once just to use the heat of the forge and two is always uh, nice because um, we usually make like a tip up and a tip down hook for turning because both of those uh, tools are more comfortable 
to turn the entire bowl with. So you can turn an entire bowl with just one of those two, but having the variations makes it more, yeah, just makes it more comfortable to turn. So, do the other one. it's a little bit uncomfortable it's like it wants to slide away when you hit it here of course it moves so you're constantly trying to to push it to the edge and hit it so yeah and also but, I noticed you had a rhythm as well didn't you yes yeah, so most what you notice with some blacksmith they uh, hit it like uh, three or four times and sometimes they like and let the hammer rest on the anvil. It's nothing you have to do, but uh, sometimes it helps to to slow down in, in your in your hammering. Just and, and and look at your piece and look what you're actually doing. So some people let use it as a tiny moment to rest and yeah, look what you're actually producing. also ready to go it's of course the, the the thinner the end gets the hotter will so the faster it gets hot so we don't have to wait as long Once it's getting colder, I do some micro adjustments. Sometimes when you hit it in a not a right angle, or like if you like lift it too far up and you hit it here, then it will bend. But it's, th those are all easy things to to repair once it's hot. So yeah, but I'm quite quite happy with that. What I do in the end is like I just check it if I'm happy with if all the sides are flat and nice and even and then because this end is going into the wood so because of, of uh, me hitting uh, it spreads it out a little bit so I'm turning it on the corner and just take down those corners a little bit sometimes it's just one or two hits just that it's not getting stuck in the woods. So one here and then one here and that should be it. And again it doesn't have to be that pointy to put it into the wood but I always like to show this process or like uh, basically get comfortable forging also for uh, when, I, when I'm teaching it. Uh, the student will have the opportunity to do this both because it's also the start of the other side when we um, then uh, make the, the cutting edge, the actual cutting edge. So I'm happy with that now so that means this is done, this is the end that then sticks in the wood, in the wooden handle. So now we repeat the same process on the other side. So now you're going to heat this up to roughly the same sort of temperature, yeah? Exactly, yeah. So the next stage will be that we create this. So we basically start, so this is what we just did. So we hammered the square on one end 
and so we do the same thing here and once this is done on this end um, I start hitting it from further back just to to spread it out and make it longer and flat but um, and, and of course if I just hit it on one point it will be wider and wider and I want to avoid that so that's why I'm flipping it over to basically keep it in line so it can be a tiny bit wider but I don't want it to too chunky on the end. So. so just to recap, we've done one end which will go into the wood. Exactly. Now we're going to do the other end the same, however we're going to take it a bit further back. Exactly, that's what we're doing. I also don't want to hit it too hard when it's cooling down because that could cause some cracks in the metal. Yeah, but that's all right. point um, where I created almost the same taper as at the back end that sticks in the wood. So now I'm starting to move further back to move more material or to make the whole thing, the whole surface more flat. Um, but I try to follow, follow the shape of the steel like the round bar. So I don't want to spread it out too much. Um, yeah, that's why I'm still turning it 90 degrees to make it one longer, uh, flatter, but like keep um, keep the diameter basically of the um, of the tool of the of the steel of the round bar. So I'm now starting to taper and making the whole thing longer and flatter. So I don't want the, the pointy bit uh, to be less than two millimeter, basically, to make it not, not make it too thin, because we also have some grinding to do in the end, uh, and then that will, that, so we will lose material. So I'm trying to not make it too thin. Basically, repeat this process until you're happy with the shape. And also, like those things, I don't know if the camera can catch this, but there are some ridges now. It is not ideal, but I don't really care because there's still a lot of metal I have to move. So I can just clean that up, even if not now, because this steel gets too cold. I just clean it up in the next round. Just. Uh, hit it or try to hit it straight with the flat piece of the hammer versus 
like too much with the net with the edge. So, but this is too cold now, so I put, put it back in. So Oliver, even though this isn't a necessarily a blacksmithing tutorial, um, but I thought we'd just take a quick few seconds out to talk about the safety. Obviously, anyone attempting this would be wearing goggles. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, uh, wearing goggles is a is a smart idea. Some uh, people also like to wear gloves. I don't because I want to feel the tools I'm working with. Um, with forging these, really, the, the worst thing that happened to me is like when the, uh, the is because there's scale flying off from the metal. Uh, once there was one flying in my shoe and like burned my foot a little bit, but that was literally the worst thing that happened to me. Um, but of course, like it is smart to wear goggles, wear gloves, and uh, earplugs um, because the bouncing is also quite loud. So can be. It is definitely beneficial to wear a safety gear. Yes. It As you can see now, like I um, lay the end piece flat on the anvil. I don't know if the camera can see that, but like, this is how I'm working. I put it like this and hit it from straight up, just to move the metal out in this direction. Sometimes I do even like I stay statically on one uh, on one part and like just move the tool slightly back just to make it flatter, like shape it how I want it. So this is the shape we created right now. Um, so it's a bit pointy in the end, nice and flat, and but not too wide. And this is the cutting edge. And this will be the cutting edge, yes. And now we have to decide if we're going to make a tip up or a tip down tool. In our case right now we make both. Um, but from a, a right-handed person's perspective, the cutting edge uh, for a tip up tool is on the left side and the cutting edge for tip down tool is on the right side. So what we do now, we once the seal is hot again, we start to hammer a bevel on one of the sides. So that's not completely necessary to do, but it just saves us a bit of grinding when we like, uh, yeah, hammer the bevel on a little bit, make this side where we want to have the bevel a bit flatter to just yeah save some save some grinding. So to hammer the bevel on, I bring the tool on the edge of the anvil again and start to hammer from here, from where I want to start, up to the top. And here again, I bring it to the edge of the anvil, just to not hit the an uh, uh, anvil with the hammer, off the edge of the hammer, uh, just like that, to just hit the steel, ideally. And you can see now it's bending up a bit because that's like because they moved it a little bit like this. That w won't be an issue. I just give it another heat and then turn it on the back so they have a. The, when it's bent like this, like a banana, like I put it so that the uh, bow of the banana is upwards and just give it a slight hit and then that will straighten it up again. Yes. So straighten it up again. And ideally the bevel is about two, two to three millimeters thick. Bend. 
So I'm almost happy with that. I think I'll give it another go and take this down a little bit. It's not too thick, but yeah, like I said, it saves itself some grinding paper. Yeah, I'm happy with that. So the general shape looks a bit like a butter knife. So um, it's it's still a little bit thick here, but like since we're grinding the final shape, that will be all right. So there's definitely less material to grind off here. So yeah, I think this is ready to go on the grinder and I can explain at the cooled down tools what we do next. So. This is now the stage we're in, so we shaped it to kind of a butter knife shape with the bevel uh, hammered on. So basically ready for grinding. What I do now is I still put the uh, uh, steel in one more time to just heat it up again, um, just to take the stress out of the steel a little bit. Um, so. Um, a friend and blacksmith of ours like explained it very well to me once. Um, uh, she said, um, "Imagine like a slice of bread that you like hammered into, like like in the middle. You just take the hammer and like hammer onto the slice of bread. Then you have a compressed part in the middle of it. Uh, so the general structure of the slice of bread changed. And what we do now is in, in heating it up, so." you kind of release the pressure of it so that the, 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 the material of bread is becoming the same kind of structure again. So it relaxes a bit more. So, so you're releasing that built up tension. Exactly, basically. basically. Yeah. Right, interesting. Yeah. So, so just to repeat then, before the grinding, you're just going to put it in the heat as exactly. is? Exactly, so I put it in once again, then we turn the oven off and let it cool down slowly. Oliver, with that stage now complete, what is next in the process? Next step is grinding. So right now we, we are at this stage, so we created the shape we want. Uh, main forging is done and now we need to clean it up. So there's like bits and pieces we, w we don't want in the cutting edge, of course. Um, and, and of course we want to make it sharp, like as sharp as possible actually, because um, after grinding, we will go over to bending, so we will um, bring it to the final shape. And from here, like we can't use machines that that well. I mean, we can grind then the outside of the tool, but like the inside will be will be harder to use. Or I mean, if you have specialized tools, then you can do that. But most people do that by hand, and it's obviously uh, easier or like more accessible than getting a machine for every single step. So, yeah. So, to kind of recap, we're going to basically move on to the grinder to kind of take it from this to that. Basically. Exactly, yeah. And we will go, we start quite rough, um, quite uh, coarse, and then like move up and like use, we use a belt grinder and like uh, use different belts uh, with higher and higher grid to make it nice and clean and smooth in the end. So Oliver, we're in the grinding room. Now obviously yes. we're borrowing Oscar Rush's grinding room, so this is obviously not your normal setup. Yes. Um, but would you like to talk through first and foremost what grit paper we're using? Yes, so we start quite rough. This is a like um, a 36 grit belt. Um, 
of course to remove the main material because there's all sorts of bumps and, and edges we want to remove um, and of course like um, like I said earlier in the video like um, that might be sometimes quite uh, thick or swollen like uh, so I want to keep that as thin as possible all the way all the way up just to for the well aesthetic reasons but also like for reasons to move that hook later in the turning process of turning a bowl. So, so while the belt is off, what are you going to be removing with this particular grade of belt? So I'm going through like over every surface. So the, this hook basically has four surfaces, like the back, the, the top, all the way around, and then the bevel. So I'm starting to grind the back flat, uh, move then the exact opposite side, like this small ridge up here, make that flat, then I shape it all the way, all the way around until I'm happy with it. And in the end I will do the bevel, but I will do that also on, on here. To the, what I want to achieve is um, having a, about a 25 degree bevel uh, for the cutting edge. And uh, I think to mention like safety wise, of course, um, if you if you're very comfortable grinding and uh, have your own setup and feel good, then you don't really need gloves. I prefer not to have gloves because uh, I feel the tool and I know what I'm doing. What is also important later, you don't want to overheat the metal. So and when you don't wear gloves, you can actually feel, oh, it's getting warmer. So. Um, then you can pay attention to that and maybe cool it down in some water. Um, another thing is, of course, earplugs if you have a very loud machine. And most important thing for grinding, because you can see on the ground there's a bunch of metal dust on here, so um, a mask is highly recommended for this. Because, yeah, the metal is flying around, you inhale everything. It will be definitely good to wear some kind of mask. And Eye protection. I have I have glasses, so the main thing don't fly in my eyes. But like it's it's definitely recommended to wear some safety gear. And obviously, it's um, with the machine on. We're not going to be able to talk while you're grinding, mm -hmm. so we'll just be able to observe through the camera. Exactly.
So I'm just stopping now because I did a bit of the bevel, but I of course want to check my angle, the angle of the tool that I'm not too steep or uh, too flat. So yeah, right now I'm about, I mean, I'm in between 22.5 and 25, which I'm happy with. So I could angle it a little bit different, but I think that's all right and I'm going to go for it. So what I do now is uh, I keep grinding down the, the bevel down a little bit more because there's quite a bit of material left here. And what I also do, like I remove the sharp corners on each side here. So just to make it more, more comfortable. And also those maybe, yeah. Just with your head when you're turning, just to have that a little bit more comfortable and no sharp edges that you cut your hand. So Oliver, we've now changed belts. Before we talk about that, you wanted to talk about in terms of how much metal you remove. Exactly. So important thing to mention is um, when you start grinding, of course, you uh, will have the, all the shiny parts. Uh, but there's, of course, like those black parts you want to remove. So you won't, don't want any of these in, in your cutting edge because that could mess up your bevel in the end. Um, just in, in, in form of like um, an, uneven, an uneven cutting edge and you don't want that at all when you, when you turn because that could of, of course like leave marks in your finished product. Yeah, so that's worth mentioning. Um, yeah, so now we switch to an 80 grit belt. Uh, we basically repeat the same process as we did with the uh, 36 um, but now of course I don't go all the way around here because I already have a sharp edge here ideally. So right now I'm again you, um, grinding the back of the tool, the opposite side of the tool and then a little bit here if I'm not happy with the shape, but that looks pretty good to me. So I mainly back the other side and bevel. And that's actually the last time I do those three sides. When I, when I go higher with the belts, with the, the grid of the belts, I just use them um, doing the back of the hook and the bevel. That's all I'm doing after this.
So what you can pay attention to when you grind the bevel, because it's uh, for beginners it's hard to to find the the point or the right angle and grinding this. So what I always do, I mean, right now it is more automatic what I'm, what I'm doing because I kind of feel where the point is. But um, I start basically when I grind the bevel, um, bring it on more onto onto this edge, or not completely on this side, and then kind of let it fall down, and then move along the surface all the way along until. And at this stage, you can also see when the like a burr flips over a little bit, and that's the sign. Okay, I'm actually reaching the bevel, and it's actually getting sharp. So, Oliver, what belts have we changed onto now? So now we're going up to 200 grit. Uh, yeah, and what I'm doing now is just doing the back of the tool and the bevel. Of course you can do the whole surface again, but it will uh, eat more of the belt, because they are not, not so cheap. Um, and it's just not necessary to do the whole thing, so just do back and bevel, because when you sharpen um, the tool later with, with, uh, with a file, or with different files, then uh, you will grind the, the a little bit rougher bit up here anyway, so that's completely enough. For me, don't know how other people make it, but for me it's completely fine. So Oliver, is this the last belt we are going to use? It is. So uh, now we moved up to 400. I usually go up to 600, but this is just what we have. That will be, uh, 400 will be completely fine. It, the tool is already quite smooth and gets sharp. Uh, it's more like to remove the, the burr here, because right now we're folding a burr over and back and over and back. And the higher we get, the more we have a chance to remove that and have less sharpening later with the files when we just use files. So, yeah, so the higher we go with the grid on the belts, the less we have to do on the tool. The main thing we really do with the first belt, the 36, like the rough uh, grid. Uh, and once this is done, you basically just go over one or two times and then you're basically done grinding. So Oliver, what's next in the process? Now we will uh, heat this piece up again and, and bend it and make a hook out of it basically. Quick and simple.
once those pieces are hot on the tip, we bring it on the anvil and push the tip of the tool about half a centimeter over the anvil, over the edge of the anvil, and then use the hammer to slightly tap it down, like kind of in, an, in a rotational movement, like this, just to bend over the tip. Yeah, and then once this is done, maybe I have to do this a few times, sometimes it works with one go, but sometimes we need to heat it up because that will, because it, uh, that piece of metal is so thin, it will cool down very quick. So, yeah, we bend it over and then we flip it around and then we also bend it with the hammer in a tapping rotational movement all the way around until it's an actual hook. Again, like I check if it's hot enough first, that's not, not quite there yet. Also not quite there, sorry. So you're just waiting for the tip? Exactly, I just want to heat the tip. It's not necessary to heat the whole thing or the first few centimeters, because I just want to work on the tip. The only benefit of heating more back is that it stays hot a little bit longer. But the, like I said, the tip of the, of the hook is so thin, it will cool down so quick. So that's why I'm only using heating the tip. Give it a little bit more. And also, like through just heating the tip, I can, I don't need any tongs necessarily to touch the tool because it's just really just the top part of the tool I'm heating up. That's almost there. I said it's quick and easy to do, but it's actually like the most uh, exciting or the most scary part of the of the making of these because you can mess it up quite quickly with the hammer and then you hit it wrong. How I, how I do. Now you see there's a slight bend. I'm, I'm pretty happy generally with the shape because the, the neck of the tool is quite thick and of course the other side is quite sharp which gives it, the, the, the thicker neck gives it a bit of more of stability and of course it will also last a bit longer if you have a, a little thicker end. Pop that back in. well so now we heat it up again and then next time I start heading from the back and around so. first I'm hitting just from the back and then once it's start curling up I go a little bit more around, but that's already now cold. So the tricky thing with this now is trying not to hit the cutting edge because that will mess it up a lot when you hit it with the, with the hammer. Yeah, that's what it is. So try not to hit the bevel anywhere here. So just going around. I want to 
to be a little bit more curled in. Because what we do in the end is like bending it back a little bit. That makes it more for certain cuts on the lathe than for the four bolts. It makes it a little bit easier. Nicest shape I've created, but it will work. It will work probably. So the last bit is um, bending the tool a little for the back, uh, because right now it's quite straight, and that would would make uh, uh, certain cuts a little more difficult when you turn. So now we bring that a little further backwards, and then the tool will be done. So. Just heat it up again. Just hold it in for a second. I think it will heat up quick. So, are you using normal pliers? Exactly. You're, so, um, uh, it, it's it's nice to have have them uh, a little bit rounded, so they don't leave any marks in the tool. If you're like uh, picky about it, don't have to. That, that will do. So, if you're, you're not really pressing the tongs in, you just like have them open and like bend it back. I will probably all right yes so move them in here and just go a little bit back uh, maybe I will do slightly more I don't know if the camera can catch that yeah I do slightly more and then I'm happy so probably heat up very quick now Go. And that's it. Okay, so what you can do if you accidentally hit the bevel with the hammer and like basically fold fold over the the cutting edge, you can fix that if you have a pair of those round pliers and you uh, when it's hot you go like around the cutting edge with your pliers. It's not like it's not super ideal, but it will will help a little bit to even it out. So that one is fine. Happy with that. So yeah, and next step is the hardening. So what are you doing now, Oliver? So right now we have to harden the steel. Um, so. In this stage, the steel wouldn't be. Um, in this stage, uh, the steel is too soft to hold the cutting edge. I mean, it w it will work, but it, you uh, the, the the bevel would just flip over probably. So we need to harden the steel and then uh, temper it again to make it a little bit softer. So right now we're bringing it up to a temperature. Uh, or bring it up to a Curie point. That's uh, Curie is French. It's named after the person who who figured that out. Um, and a good indicator for that is like using a magnet. So we're basically heating it up to a dark orange, orangey color. Then test if it's still magnetic. And you can see it's it's working. And the back of the tool will probably be magnetic. But if it's not magnetic anymore, that's our indicator to be able to quench it and, and harden it. So once it's reached that point, we get it out in the oil and move it around. 
and that's how we harden the steel. That looks pretty good. So you see, not magnetic at all. So I know that is the right color, and I still put it back in. I also, it's not necessary that the whole thing is glowing, so I just want the tip. So that's the only thing I want to harden, just the few, first few centimeters. Back here, that doesn't really matter. And it's also the, the risk, if it's too hot, that the steel can crack, because it could be too stressful to the steel when we quench it, when we cool it down too quick. So put it back in, just the tip. Checking it. That will be all right. It's going to go in, in the oil, in and out, and then I move it. Is this a particular type of oil or? That is just vegetable oil. Oh, and something else, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Probably some chips for dinner. Yeah, you can uh, get professional quenching oil, but uh, for, for this type of tools, uh, regular vegetable oil is fine. So it's some kind of stop moving and just leave it in. But you can still see the bubbles coming up. That's mostly the point where I get hungry when I haven't eaten. <laughs> I guess the, it smells a bit like french fries or something. Deep frying something. So, oops, some rack or something. <laughs> yeah. But that's it. Just pop that over. And so you, you now will leave this to rest? Yes, that's now done. We just wipe that oil off. Um, yeah, and then what we, what we do next actually is we wipe the oil off, then um, we use the belt grinder again and use an old belt to make the back shiny. Um, you will see that later why we make it shiny to see the, actually the, the colors uh, tempering for the tempering colors is there's a certain color we want at, at the cutting edge um, that indicates like if it's hard but soft enough to sharpen it like hard enough to hold the edge but soft enough to sharpen it again because that's what, what we have to do a lot of times so I return okay so now we just wipe off the oil it's still quite warm but you can see here, like underneath the, all the black stuff, which is like left over from the oil, that it's a, a nice gray color. That's also a good indicator for it to be hard. Yeah. Again, like I'm, I have to say, like I'm not a professional blacksmith. It's just like I'm just doing the things that people told me to do, and like wh what to look for basically. And I always look for that, and so far it worked. So what I do now is I just remove all the black stuff and make the back shiny. So we use the grinder, but we're not really grinding anything. It would be also hard to grind anything off now because uh, the steel is hard, hardened. Um, so it's in general, you, you can take material off, but um, yeah, you need much higher grit and you need it needs to be more aggressive to actually remove material from this. So, so the purpose of this is just to clean it up? Just to clean it up, basically, yeah. We obviously can't like clean up the inside very well now, but uh, just the back uh, is completely enough for the next step. And what grit is this paper? 
Uh, I think this is an old uh, about 400 grit belt, so it it will not do much. So, but it will remove the the uh, stain of the oil definitely. So yeah, that's basically it. I'm happy with that. And what you can also see now is that through, through the bending process we have a nice little hollow in the back of the tool what makes uh, sharpening later much easier because you basically just remove material from those high points here and here. If obviously where the black stuff still is visible that's the low point and the shiny bits are the high points. So when we use the file later to sharpen the tool, the file will just sit on those shiny high points and we have to remove less material, which is definitely a good thing. So what we do now to finish it off is um, a process called tempering. So right now the steel is hardened uh, and to temper it we, we, we have different, different options to do. So what I usually do is I, I hold it in front of the gas forge, um, heat it up, not at the tip, so I don't want that to get too hot, but I want to heat up the, um, the thicker part of the, of the steel. And what will be visible is like there will be some colors rising up to the top. So there will be, there will be a golden color uh, followed by a uh, purple, purple bluish color. And what I want in the tip of the tool is I want, I want the, the golden, light golden, golden mackerel color. Um, but not, uh, not the, not the purple at all. Not in the, not in the main cutting edge. The purple can be in the neck of the tool. Purple means uh, it is a little bit softer. So it will hold the edge, but you will have to sharpen it more. So golden is ideal. Um, and what we do, we wait until we see the colors rising. And once the golden color hits the tip of the tool, we cool it down in water. And what, so are the to, other, what are the other ways of doing this? The other ways of doing this is like, uh, if you don't have a forge like this, maybe you, uh, you have a, uh, a coal forge, you can like lay it like over the coals, that the coals are, the hot coals are mainly under the thick, uh, thick part of the, of the tool. You can also use a blowtorch and like heat it up here. You can uh, use your kitchen stove and like just put it on the flame, but you always uh, heat the thick part of the steel and wait until the colors are rising. That's also, that's the only reason why we make the back shiny, to just see those colors. So, sometimes you have to wait a while until it's actually warm enough and rising. Depending on uh, many things like outside temperature. Of course, in the winter, like uh, in Sweden where we live, and it's like minus 10 degrees outside, then of course it takes a little bit longer. So, we now just like put the whole tool in and like have the, the back of the tool heating up so that we see the colors here better. Um, 
So what we just did like wasn't working very well because the the, the fin bit got hot too quick. But now, now this is now safer because we definitely heat up the thicker part first. It's a tricky thing to, to catch this on camera really. Once again, what colour are you waiting for? We're waiting for the uh, golden colour, followed by a blue-purple colour. So the golden will rise first, followed by the blue-purple. And we want the purple in the neck, the golden in the tip. Now it's obviously purple down here and the golden is right here, but that's what we want to have in the tip of the tool. Now we also know why blacksmith workshops are ideally dark <laughs> to see all of this stuff. So now you're waiting for the tip. I'm waiting for the tip, yeah. I'm waiting for that section to be on the tip. Actually, might have to eat it again. <laughs> I think that's enough. We could still wait until it's traveling a little further up, but that's good enough. So now we just stop heat traveling up and just cool it down. So this is water? This is just water, yeah, exactly. I still, I still move it to, uh, yeah, just to cool it down a little bit quicker. And now obviously the back of the tool is much hotter than the tip. The tip is now cool. But when I stick the tool further in, just to wanna, don't want to hit the plastic bucket, because then it could burn a hole through it. Yeah, but that's it. So Oliver, what's next in the process? So now it's basically done. We just have to sharpen it. Um, I mean, we ground it quite far, but uh, the cutting edge can still be quite rough. So when I, when I touch it now, I feel like, oh yeah, that's actually all right, but there's still a little bit to do. So what I'm doing now, I use a needle file um, to do the, the rough bit on the inside and then I use a, a flat file or a stone to get rid of the burr I'm creating while sharpening the inside. Yeah. So I often like to place it on a piece of wood, like sitting on a table or having a, a chopping block or something in front of me and sitting there and then you obviously follow the bevel we crowned earlier on the belt grinder and follow that all the way around. Right now it's nice because it's, uh, it's black, so when I start filing, I see what I'm doing because it's getting shiny underneath. And what I do is I move the tool up or like in, 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 in angles. In angles, do you say? It is, yep. yep. Yeah. <laughs> so kind of back and forth. Exactly, Get back and forth, all the way to the tip. And like, you always try, you, so I'm not staying in one spot because that could obviously like create a dip. So I don't want that. So I want it even, it's, a, it's an even surface already, and I want to keep this even surface all the way up to the tip. 
So I'm starting here. And I also just um, sharpen the the piece I'm I'm cutting actually with. So there's no need to sharpen back here because it's not what you're using while you're turning a bowl. So the the highest point or like the point over here is like the, the first point you're actually cutting something with. So, so that's that, the only part that you Exactly. So you cut you're cutting from here and but use this the, the whole hook for cutting when you turn the bowl. But nothing nothing below below this point. So I'm I'm going a little bit over, but not the whole surface. Obviously, when you when you use your tools for a while, then you don't have this black stuff um, to remove. But in order to to actually see what you're doing, you can just mark the cutting edge, the bevel, with a sharpie or something like that, and make it black again. And this is all the inside, yeah. And it's all the inside, yeah. So ju that's just very helpful to me to see what I'm doing and if I'm actually like holding the file in the right position so that it's not going like above or like below like if I would have a, have the file like this then it would round off the cutting edge and that wouldn't be helpful so I'm holding the file flat on the surface When you go over the back of your hook and like with, with your fingernail, then you feel a little burr, and that's the indicator to um, that you that you've done enough on this side, and then you basically flatten or like getting rid of this burr with a flat file over the over those high points that I mentioned earlier. So. Depending on how, how big that burr is, you can have like different files or like some uh, fine water stones are completely good. There's different different uh, files, diamond files, or the stones. Stones like last much longer. The diamond files are obviously like uh, just have a they just have a coat of um, diamond material on top, but at some point this is gone, and then it's not uh, that efficient anymore. So I like I quite like stones. So that's when it's getting a bit squeaky sometimes. Yeah, this is like a bit hard to see. I'm going over the surface all the way around. Whatever you prefer, you can do like rotational movements or like straight back and forth. It's usually not that much you have to do and when you feel that the burr is gone then the hook is basically ready to go. So another thing is also while you're turning and when you want to figure out oh is my tool still sharp is just looking on the cutting edge and if you see like a reflection on your cutting edge then it's basically saying, oh, I'm dull, I need sharpening. Yeah, but this, that feels good. So when you're teaching people to do this in person, yes. um, 
do you make sure they get to a finished edge before ready to use? Exactly, yeah. So when I'm teaching, like the goal of the, of the class is having a finished tool ready to turn a ball. And so one thing I think we can maybe touch on briefly is obviously when we're going to talk about kind of some ideas for handles in a moment, but in terms of the sharpening, when people are actually using this, um, they're actually turning, um, do they follow a similar process to kind of hone the edge um, in terms of maintenance moving forward? I believe so. I, I mean, I know a lot of people struggle with sharpening in general, not just the, the ball turning hooks. And there is not much uh, advice out there for sharpening. I think like, there's two videos. You made one with Sharif, uh, which is a good one. And yeah, but I think like in general, we, we need to talk a bit more about sharpening because that's always a, a good thing to do. Like everybody likes sharp tools, but not everybody knows how to sharpen their right. tools. Right? <laughs> So yeah, there are obviously like many different uh, files you can get to sharpen your tools. I always go for a bit rougher ones. You can, uh, you, those are like called needle files, they're uh, a little bit rough. You can also use chainsaw files. I don't have a chainsaw file right here, um, but what, whatever really fits in, in your hook you can use. Some chainsaw files are a bit thicker, so it will be, will be harder to get through your tool, depending, of course, what shape of tool you make. This is a quite a, a quite a small hook, uh, but if you have a bigger hook, a chainsaw file is fine. Um, people could argue that the chainsaw file is too rough, but uh, I think it's a lot easier. For, for me, it's a, the, the process of uh, sharpening is easier with a, with a rougher file, um, at least first with a rougher file and then go um, to, a, to a diamond file um, to clean it off a little bit and make it a little bit uh, smoother, or make the surface a little bit smoother. But in my opinion, uh, it doesn't really matter. Even if the, the surface is quite rough, you can uh, turn a really nice finish on your bowl. So yeah, those are various files. This is called a needle file. Then those are all diamond files from various makers um, that you can get. The price difference is quite high. <laughs> so from, uh, from quite cheap to quite expensive to, well, yeah, kind of middle range. So, but there's various things you can get. It's more about what you're comfortable using, really. So Oliver, just to kind of, as we approach the end, um, you want to give a, a few suggestions you said on handles? Yes. So it's obviously not, not super difficult. Um, uh, so you can actually like split a log. Uh, this is a, a nice ash log. You can just split and carve down. Um, and then what you're going to do is you drill a hole just in the diameter. Of, of your hook and place it in, like knock it a few times on your chopping block and then it will be stuck in there, basically. Sometimes when it's a little bit loose, so you can uh, wrap a thin piece of leather around or maybe sometimes even some paper. Uh, wrap it, so if you don't have the right size drill, for example, uh, when, I, when I started handling my tools, I didn't have the right size drill and I just like moved the drill into the handle. So that works as well. It's of course not super pretty, but it will work. Um, but once you have the, the right size drill, then it's nice. So it is uh, maybe a good thing to test drill before before you put the handle in, just to see, is this going to fit? Is it too loose or will it be too tight? So if it will be too tight, then it could likely crack your handle open, which would be a little bit sad because that's, it's nice to, um, to test it before. Um, alternative to a split log is of course you can, if you have a straight branch somewhere. Uh, if you have a straight branch, ideally dry, because when it's green, and you drill a hole, then the hole will not be round anymore when it dries, and that co could cause that the uh, tool is falling out. And in terms of the, um, the taper that you did on the actual metal part itself, so this is why you did a taper, isn't it? Exactly. So it can go in and hold in place. Exactly. So it's more like the taper is more like 
for it to get in. It's not really holding it. So some people think that like this point is like, I mean, you can hammer it in uh, further so that it's actually sticking a bit in the wood if you make this really pointy. But that is not necessary, in my opinion. So I saw Toolmaker State just take down the edges a little bit uh, just to make it easier to go into the hole. And how long should the actual handle be? Is there a recommendation? Uh, it's really up to you what you feel comfortable with if you like how and also how you turn a lot of turners just like use it like this some people like to clamp it under the arm um, yeah that's really up to preference it's what also what you, what you sh uh, shouldn't underestimate is like this storage of those hooks because if you have a few of them and quite tall they take a bunch of space especially when you live in the van like us for three years then um, <laughs> it could be beneficial if the handles are a bit shorter I like I like shorter handles I'm fine with shorter handles but yeah it's really what you prefer using and how much does the actual metal part go in um, um, it's about, uh, like, how, how do you measure that? Um, I'd say like 10 to 15 centimeters. Right. Yeah. And lastly, the sheaf. Yes, of course, you can make a... <laughs> so, so, so this one here is German ingenuity. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's the high quality of German engineering <laughs> for years uh, invented. Um, yeah, that's like a very simple version. Just get some gardening hose and pop it on and that will secure your cutting edge safely. Also, when you like transport it in your car and like the tools are rattling around, those, those usually stick to it. If you want to do a little uh, more fancy one, um, you can also, this is um, also a piece of wood drilled, drilled in a little bigger than the diameter. And of course, you need to need to uh, consider the hook and the, the bending of the hook so that it's actually fitting comfortable. So it's also recommended that you like test drill before you make the actual sheath. Like if you feel like, okay, my tool go, goes in comfortably, then you're on the right way. And then this is a little wedge you can put behind and press in. And this, this hook is maybe actually a little bit too thin for this sheath, but it will will work. So there you have it my friends, that is a wrap for this video. Oliver, thank you so much. There's a couple of very important, well three very important things I need to mention with this video. Number one, this is the first time Oliver has been on video teaching, is that correct? <laughs> That's correct. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Secondly, English is not his first language. He's been very conscious of that throughout filming, off camera as well. In my opinion, he's done amazingly well. I always stress this, that listen, your English is a million times better than my German. <laughs> Saying that, yeah, I still right. count to 20 in German. I'm quite proud of that, right? <laughs> but honestly, he was very conscious of that. And I, I totally get that. But in my opinion, you've done amazingly well. And especially Thank trying you. to explain certain technical terms in a language that's obviously not native to yourself. Mm. I know it's very, very difficult. Um, so I do need to kind of stress that. Your know, Oliver's very, very conscious, but I kept assuring him he's doing fantastically well. And thirdly, this is not his normal work environment. So it's always difficult when you're working in a workspace or a workshop that's not your own to get familiarized with the equipment and all the kind of instruments around you. And so I just want to kind of stress for those three reasons, you know, this video, we tried our utmost best for Oliver to simply show his process. And I think it's also important that we stress that this is just Oliver's process. He's not saying okay. this is the only process or it's the best process. It's his process that he's refined. But it's importantly that I stress that he does this full time. He teaches and he makes. It's not like some little part-time hobby. So how many hook tools would you say you've forged and you've made? <sighs> Definitely over a hundred by now. Yeah. Yes. And he teaches, he's been teaching here currently in the UK and elsewhere across Europe and abroad as well. So like I said, you know, you know Oliver brings with him a, an extensive amount of experience with turning and forging and so forth. So in his video, he's shown what he, everything that he's learned up until this point that we're filming. So like I said, I really do appreciate you taking the time to share that. This is potentially 
The first video that goes into this much detail is showing how to make one of these tools specifically in relation to turning bowls on a pole lathe. So a final reminder of a few things. Number one, I'm going to put a link down below to the part one of this two-part series where Oliver's wife, Rally Klotzek, is going to be showing from start to finish how to turn a wooden bowl on a foot-powered pole lathe. I would highly, highly recommend you go check that out. And these two, two videos accompany each other absolutely beautifully. And in that first video, you're gonna see these tools being put to use. And this is a very important thing. These tools are designed to be used. You know, and you think about how much just that one tip of the tool does all the work. Yes. Right? Exactly, yeah. Um, and so, and there's a lot of nuance to it. And hopefully we've portrayed that on this video. Uh, uh, one thing I will, not so much apologize for, but I will kind of stress as a caveat that when there's a camera shoved in your face mm -hmm. and you're trying to do something so refined, it's very difficult to do. So Oliver, I think done incredibly well. And in this video, we're just trying to keep things real about what is involved. Um, would I be right in saying that obviously there are times where, you know, you may have to repeat? Oh, definitely. The yeah, making yeah, process. Yeah. Especially in the beginning. So it's like, you, you mess up, but that's how you learn, really. And that's maybe something I, uh, I, we can add. Like, it's, oh, it's, it's great to learn through videos, but it's learning in person from somebody who knows what to do. Um, it's, it's much more beneficial for you and you, you support those people, you support blacksmiths and like the, the community. And there's a bunch of people out there who do an amazing job. People I learn from and many more. Yeah, and on that note, a final reminder that Oliver and his wife, Rally, they teach and make full time. This is what they do here in the UK, across Europe, and back in the US as well. So what I'm gonna do, like I said, I'm gonna put a link below to their website, and I would highly recommend if you get any value from this video whatsoever, we hope that you have done so, is to go check out the link below to their website. On there you can find a plethora of details about workshops, about bowls, about tools, about everything they have going on. They're very inspiring to follow also on Instagram, and a link to that will be down below in the description. And with those two combined, the website and the Instagram, you can be kept up to date with the workshops, etc., that they run all over the world, as well as the tools and the wares that they sell. As we stress throughout this video, the different stages of these tools, especially the raw metal all the way to a finished tool, you can actually buy it from their website. They ship all over the world. So if you just think to yourself, you know what, I can't be bothered, I want to buy the finished product, you can do that. They, they supply constantly throughout the world. This is what they do. Link below to their website on that. You can find out about the ordering process. And like I said, I would highly recommend touching on what Oliver has just mentioned. In terms of learning in person, I always stress with my channel, and I mean it with sincerity, that these videos are a fantastic resource. However, I always stress it does not beat learning in person. Mm. Be it tool making, be it spoon carving, be it any kind of discipline, nothing will beat learning that in person. So by following the website below, if they're running courses near you, you are more than welcome to join in. And I tell you what, you will have an absolutely fantastic time out. The previous weekend that we're doing this filming, there was an event, the Bodgers Ball, which is Britain's largest green woodworking event, and Oliver, was teaching this very thing. So he was receiving some amazing feedback from the students. I remember speaking to one in particular who was just raving about Oliver's teaching. So once again, as a final recap, link below to part one of this two-part series, teaching you from start to finish how to turn a wooden bolt on a pole lathe. And in this part two, obviously we're looking at the forging of the tool, as well as some tips and suggestions of making a handle, the sheath, sharpening, etc. And like I said, there's kind of links below with the timestamp of the different sections of this video. So as you move forward, you can use, use this video as a point of reference. So as a last request, you get any value from this video whatsoever. It will mean the world to me and to Oliver and Rally. You go check out the website below with everything they have to offer as well as their Instagram. And now, with all of my monumental talking out the way, are there any last words from yourself, Oliver, to those that are watching who are maybe thinking about giving this a go and making their own tool or coming to even see you guys to learn in person? Uh, yeah, I just encourage people to do it and get into it. If you want to learn it, you will find a way. If it's very, even if it's very simple, but just like try it or reach out to people and like ask questions, reach out to us, reach out to other makers and just ask questions and like move on, like just, just get started and the rest will follow. Oliver, a sincere thank you once again.
Thank you so much. For Danke schön. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you have for German words I remember, <laughs> right? So, guys, once again, I really, really do sincerely appreciate you watching. If you have done up until this point in the video, really hope you gain some value from this video also. And like I said, links to everything down below. And on that note, as always, I hope whatever you're doing, you have a blessed day, a blessed week ahead. From Oliver Klotzek and myself, Zed Outdoors, peace out.